Welcome to the Relationship Recovery Podcast, hosted by Jessica Knight, a certified life coach who specializes in narcissistic and emotional abuse. This podcast is intended to help you identify manipulative and abusive behavior, set boundaries with yourself and others, and heal the relationship with yourself so you can learn to love in a healthy way. Hello, my name is Jessica Knight, and thank you so much for being here today. Today, I have a very special guest, Nia Renee. Nia is known as How to Love a Battered Woman on Instagram, where she posts a lot after abuse, overcoming narcissistic abuse, and love after abuse. She also discusses life during a chronic illness. On this podcast, we talk about love after abuse. We go back to what it felt like to be in the abusive relationship. Nia Renee shares that it's hard for her to go back to that place because she has been healed and healing for a while. I feel a little bit closer to that space. So I talk a lot about what it was like for me to learn how to love again and understand what love is. This is a really important episode, especially if you're trying to understand how to love after abuse. All of her links will be in the show notes below. And I hope you really enjoy this episode. If you are on the path of understanding that you're in an emotionally abusive relationship or even how to love again, this is something I love working with clients about. And so you can always reach out to me at Jessica at JessicaNightCoaching.com or go online, EmotionalAbuseCoach.com or on Instagram at EmotionalAbuseCoach. And I'd love to set up time to speak with you. Hi, Nia Renee. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks for having me. I would love if you could introduce yourself to us and tell us about who you are and what you do. Yeah, my name is Nia Renee. I go by Nia Renee or Coach Nia Renee. I am a certified relationship coach, a certified motivational speaker. I'm a brand new author, actually. And Mm -hmm. I just (laughs) saw that. Can you tell us the name of your book? Yes, I just launched my very first book called Letters to You, and it can be found on Amazon. And it's probably the most vulnerable I think the world will ever see me because it's a book that I put together that has all of my deepest like journal entries Mm. and just things that I was enduring while I was in abusive, not toxic, narcissistic relationships, struggling through some things that I was dealing with after I was raped in high school. And so it's just in letters that I've written to people that, you know, was tasked to me by my therapist to really show people what I was truly dealing with and kind of what my healing, a bit of what my healing looked like. Oh, that sounds amazing. And I'm sure we'll touch on some of that journey today. So the book will be such a great compliment for people that really resonate with you and your story after they listen to this. Yeah. So uh, you already just touched on a few parts of your story. I know from following you on Instagram that you were once in an emotionally abusive relationship, I'm sure. I mean, I know in my story, it's more than one, so I don't want to downplay. It seems like there's been multiple abuses. And I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about your story, because I know now you're in a very healthy relationship with somebody who seems to really love and admire and appreciate you and vice versa. And so I know it's like a probably a very big story to tell, but maybe just start if you could just start with like your journey through abusive relationships and what like sort of what you started to realize as you began to make your way to the partner you have now. Yeah. So for me. I have an extensive history of abuse and with domestic violence and just kind of how I grew up. I grew up in a very toxic and abusive household as a child with my mother and my father and my two siblings. And that kind of shaped the way my relationships unfolded for the rest of my life, essentially until I realized that something was not right. I realized things were kind of off. And so I don't talk to my mother. I've been no contact with my mother for quite some time now. I don't talk to my half siblings. Actually, the only person I do talk to is my own father. Mm -hmm. We've been able to work through a lot of our differences and, and he and I are in such a great place now. 
I was raped in high school. I was raped in college. And once I got to college, I found my first relationship where I was physically assaulted, sexually assaulted, just kind of physically abused in abused in so many different ways in that relationship. And after that, I've had a few more tumultuous relationships and not even just romantic relationships. It was platonic relationships. Just all of my relationships just were not the healthiest relationships. Yeah. And my final relationship with my ex-boyfriend, he was the emotionally, mentally abusive ex. And mm -hmm. he was a bit sexually abusive as well. And once I got out of that relationship, we were together for eight months. But once I got out of that relationship, I was like, I've got to figure out what it is about me that's attracted to these type of people. Mm -hmm. And during my healing journey and going to therapy and, you know, talking with my therapist, I realized, well, and actually I did EMDR as well. Yeah. And with that, I realized that a lot of my trauma stemmed from my childhood and my mother was the root of a lot of why I was attracted to people that were this way and why I was attracted to people who just very much were a symbol of her in a sense. Yeah. It, was, it was like I was in a relationship with different versions of my mother. Yeah. And so would you say that your mom, like, as we know, many narcissists or almost all narcissists are not diagnosed. Would you say that she has very strong narcissistic traits? Oh, yeah. 100 percent. She yeah. has, you know, with my dad, he's got narcissistic tendencies. I think a lot of us do. A lot of people have those tendencies. Yeah. Self-aware, then, you know, obviously we're going to make certain decisions that aren't the best. But with my mother. I do firmly believe that there is a mental health component. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I have read various blogs that you have on your website, how to love a battered woman.com. There's one that I went back to before our conversation today about, it was like, basically like, it's almost like a letter to the ex, the abusive ex. And you said, I think about you often but not like how you think. And then in that blog, you talk about the remnants of that relationships, like kind of coming up and creeping up in the healthy relationship. And I think a lot of us feel that way. I think a lot of us feel like we have this like cloud of abuse following us and we're like constantly reworking it and reframing it and wanting to be open to love, but obviously being like terrified and traumatized. And I'm curious if you could tell us a little bit about like how those remnants existed in the early part of your relationship, even though you got out of it and it was still very present in your life. Yeah, I think a lot of it was the feeling of like, is this too good to be true? Because genuinely, when you ask that yourself that question, the answer is yes. But with my husband, like he wasn't love bombing me. He wasn't just doing like, I don't know how to explain it, right? He wasn't doing what they typically do when you are with someone who is masking their personality. So it wasn't the question of, is this too good to be true? But it was more of the question of like, am I really ready for this? Because this man is amazing and he's very like, but am I ready for this? Yeah. Am I still damaged? Am I still, you know, and I'd done at that point, I had been almost two years deep of extensive, intensive therapy. But there were just certain times where I would just be like being myself and I'm waiting for my husband to respond negatively mm -hmm. where a sense where like he wouldn't respond at all or he'd like, oh, my God, you're so cute instead of like, oh, my God, why are you such an idiot? Like, you know what I mean? And so it's just times like that where it's like you're so used to being ready to respond or have them respond in the way that what we're used to and where it kind of pulls out our PTSD a little bit, where with him, it's like he would, ne he's literally never responded that way. Yeah. So he would like, look at me and be like, are you all right? Like, and you guys see that, like when 
Mm-hmm. I do like skits and stuff like that. And then it's like, and you're you like, right? no, I'm like, not all right. Like I'm not. Yeah. I am and I'm not like yeah I am like right. genuinely would be like are you all right and I'm like yeah and he's like well did you like, what's going on so we would like talk about it I'm like yeah like especially like there was like one video that I posted where I'd like gotten out of the shower and I still had like soap on my shoulder and he's like he would you literally yell at you because you still had soap on you and I'm like yeah yeah like, like it would be like the dumbest like just me being just a human being I'm just a person like you know like we're not 100 percent perfect people and yeah he would get so mad the smallest things and so with my husband i'm like waiting for him to get mad and i've only seen my husband mad when it comes to things that are like affecting us so like with my health and doctors are being like dismissive or gaslighting he i've only seen him mad in that sense like and when him and i have disagreements and stuff like that like it's not emotionally charged with anger like him and I've never gotten into an argument and we've been together for almost three years like we've never screamed at each other we've never yelled at each other we've never gotten to an argument with each other like we've never crossed those boundaries with each other but those are boundaries that we set very very early on in our relationship but yeah I mean there would be remnants and pieces of like I don't know it's so hard to explain because I feel like it's like I honestly if I'm going to be if I'm going to be honest I feel like I'm so far removed from that now Mm -hmm. that it's almost hard to try and put into words what I was experiencing back then but I do know that it's just one of those things where it's like you're going to be very cautious you're going to be very skeptical when you feel like you've found someone who is being nice and and thing and is very sweet because it's almost hard to spot the difference between how it started with my ex versus how it started with my husband. But the thing that I tell my clients all of the time is, is there's still a difference. You can still tell a difference, right? There's a difference in how your body feels. I was never physically afraid of my husband. Now, when I was dating my ex and we would go on dates, I remember being very like my body would be very tensed up. I would not want to be leaning close to him. And I would just kind of be like, kind of sort of away. And we shrug that off as like, oh, well, we're just, you know, we're just trying to get to know somebody. And like, we don't really necessarily trust it. And it's like, no, our bodies feel that way for a reason. Our bodies feel uncomfortable for a reason. They're, our bodies can sense when something is not right or something is off. And that's how I was able to tell the difference with my husband, because I was never afraid of him. I was never, my body has never tensed up around him. I've never wanted to not be around him. I've never been afraid. His energy has never scared me. I've never been anxious or any of those things around him. And that's how I know that there's the, that's the difference. Yeah. And I think I'm a little removed, but closer than you are in something that, that, and this was you you this was in that blog post. I'll link that blog post to these show notes so anybody can read it or you know go to your website to see your writings. But I think it's that feeling of like you're activated by the trauma and you're just waiting for something to go wrong or that like once you express your feelings, the other person is going to tell you that they're wrong or they're going to downplay them and then it doesn't happen and it almost makes you expect it more of like okay, well, it's going to happen. It has to happen. Yeah. And then it's like that training, right? But I think we're so used to training ourselves to tell ourselves it's fine. And then it's not. But with your husband, and I feel this with my current partner, at the beginning was just like, it was like, I was just, I was waiting to be told that my feelings are wrong. I was waiting to be judged for something that was small, like a scratch on my head or, you know, or something like that, like that I was going to be made out to be this like incompetent, horrible person. For basic human things, basic human needs, basic human happenings. And it does take, it takes a while to get to the other side. But I think what's something beautiful about the way that you explained it is that now hearing your story of where you are now, you feel so far away from that. And you're actually able to experience what love feels like. Yeah. I mean, it's, I feel like I'm just so far removed and people ask all the time too, when I do my skits and my videos, like, Obviously, I play them up a little bit because you have they're obviously with creating content and creating art in the way that I do or the way that we do. Um, you know, we we have to have a certain level of where people can feel what is actually happening. 
And so sometimes things are a bit over dramatized and stuff like that. But yeah, I feel like I'm so far removed from it. So when I do some skits sometimes, like I have to really dig deep into like dig back into it because with Tyler, I just feel so safe. I feel so loved. I feel so safe. And so a lot of the things that I'm doing now and a lot and the framework of my content has changed a bit because I am focusing more on the healthy version of things. And, you know, and I want people to be able to see that at more than, you know, the bad stuff. But there are times where him and I will talk or he'll say something and I'll have a thought of like, oh, wait, you know, this is how my ex used to be. So things get a lot better instead of having a full on like flashback a thought that you know pops in your brain in your mind or your or or, but your body does still feel it though your body still feels like it's waiting for that impact in a certain way and our bodies hold a lot of things within them so it takes it takes a while for that trauma to really lessen because I don't think it Mm -hmm. ever goes away but I think it I think it gets lighter I think it gets it's so, yeah, I feel, I mean, okay. it's, yeah. If, if I'm being completely honest, yeah, I feel like I'm just so far removed from that because of just the person that he shows me he is every single day. He's never, ever changed who he is. He's mm. never changed the person that he is. Yeah. And so something I wanted to touch on with you today was about like the green flags and the red flags of dating. And I think you are touching on a lot of the green flags of what to look for and what to see in a partner. and. I'd like to kind of hone in on that a bit. And you said some like uh, uh, with your partner, there are a few things that you already named. And I'm curious if there's anything you want to add to it. What you named was that he felt safe. Your body felt safe. You didn't have a fight or flight or any other trauma responses coming up. You felt like this person feels safe. You also said that he didn't change who he was. So the mask didn't fall off. There wasn't a mask on. It was this consistency from this person And the sense of like validation from the way that he spoke to you, he saw you. What are some other green flags that you would name or that you work with clients on noticing dating after abuse? I think my, so I I do have an intentional dating workbook where I discuss like some of what my red flags to pay attention to. And one of the red flags that I discuss that is also associated with green flags is do their words match their actions? Mm. someone can pump you full of these beautiful words they can paint this gorgeous picture for you but do they give you the picture do they follow up with that you know what I'm saying and so one of the things that I tell clients to pay attention to is if their actions aren't matching their words that's something that you really need to pay attention to and with my husband you know if he said he was going to do something he did and oftentimes he wouldn't even say he was going to do something he would just do it And his actions have always solidified how he feels. Like if he tells me he loves me, he proves it by his actions. If he tells me he's never going to do something, his actions prove that. The biggest thing that I tell clients right now too, and it's a harsh reality, and sometimes it it, it might hurt a little bit hearing it, but if they wanted to, they would. You know, if someone Mm -hmm. wanted to be a certain way with you, they would be that way. And the way you trust that is by if their actions speak to that. And so he's never changed who he is. He wakes up every single day and he's the exact same person he was when he went to sleep the night before. I've never feel like I'm on ice with him. I never feel like I have to walk on eggshells. I never question what version of him I'm going to get that day. He is consistently consistent with who he is. And if someone's not consistently consistent with who they are as a person, those are things that you need to pay attention to because that's how you know when the mask starts to slip. That's how you know that. And, and, and you know, in this field of work and talking about how it takes three months or six months or sometimes a year for someone to change, as I'm in a healthy relationship now in hindsight's 2020 and having the tools that I have now, I don't necessarily agree with that anymore. I think if you don't have the tools, I think if you don't have the ability to have access to what we have now and and get to see examples, if you just if you simply don't have these tools, then yeah, it's going to take you a lot longer to see. But I don't necessarily agree with that because there are signs mm-hmm. all over the place. I mean, early, early signs 
Yeah. I feel like some of them are like at this point, like you and I are in this world and they're like obvious to us, but if you could just name what those early, early signs are, maybe just like three that you consistently see come up in your client base. I think that'd be really helpful. Yeah. I think one early sign is, and I spoke about this, I think I did a video or two about this. I work with clients on it a lot is Mm -hmm. their consistency. If somebody's inconsistent with you, but they're telling you that they want you and they're they're going to give you the world and they're going to do this and they're going to do that. But then they talk to you every three days. The only time you guys have conversations is if you text them first or you call them first. If you're the one that's putting in all the effort with someone who's telling you they're going to give you the world, they're full of shit. Mm-hmm. And then just and that's just me being honest. You know what I mean? It's the way that people if they show up the way that they say that they're going to green flag. Another thing to pay attention to is how do they talk about their circumstances? How do they talk about the people that they've been in relationships with before? And how do they talk about the people that are currently in their lives? A lot of times us people, us survivors, we're very empathetic people. We're very understanding people. We want to help other people because we see ourselves as, well, if I'm this broken and damaged person and I want people to love me then why can't I love somebody who's also damaged and broken? And that got me into a lot of trouble because mm-hmm. the, uh, the the other person's not necessarily thinking that way. And so one of the things to pay attention to is, oh my God, I feel like I just lost my, what was I saying? <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think it's like, I mean, it's so, I think when we get like so wrapped up in the red flags and we start working through them, it's like, it's, there are so many that we see, but we also push them away and we can normalize them. And I think the work is just to really allow yourself to be right with reality. And when you have been abused before to let yourself go slow and be honest with yourself. Be honest with it how you like feel and be right honest there, about like what is coming. Like, mm, not today. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. Um, I'm sure when I listen back to this, I'll think like that you actually made it. <laughs> um, but I guess as we like begin to talk about like what intentional dating even looks like, because I know that is something that you work with people on and I'm sure people are wondering how you connected with your partner. Yes. Uh, yeah, let's start there. How did you yeah. connect with your partner? So I'm so passionate about intentional dating. It's something that that's how I found my 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 husband. That's how our relationship was shaped. And I'm so passionate about it. And I think the funny part about and I'll answer your question here in just a second. I think the funny part about it is, is that when I made my intentional dating workbook, a lot of the clients that I see they ask the same questions that I answer in my intentional dating workbook, which is actually reaffirm, which is reassuring to me because I kind of just like, you know, I worked so hard on it and then I put it out and it was like, I don't even know if this is like the right market, but it's, you know, mm-hmm. so I met my husband on Bumble and we actually were featured in Bumble last year. Um, our story got picked up by Bumble. And so we met on Bumble and Bumble, mm-hmm. is, for those that don't know, Bumble is a dating site where you it's kind of like obviously like tinder and all those other sites where you swipe right and swipe left for somebody that you may be interested in but it shows you if someone's like looking for a relationship like what what they're looking for and if you match with somebody you the the woman has to message first so the conversation won't start until you know the woman uh, messages first and the funny part is is my husband was on that site because he felt like he never heard back from people and like he would reach out and nothing would happen so he was like well I wanted to be on Bumble because you know I have if someone's genuinely interested in me they're going to reach out first and so yeah we matched on Bumble and just immediately like hit it off and so with him this is where I go with intent or when to pay attention to the green flags pay attention to how someone is if someone says they want to take you out and they want to get to know you they're going to make that happen my husband was like listen um here's my he was like i'm taking a shot in the dark here's my number um i think we have a connection i'd love to take you out on a date can we text instead of being on this app i was like sure so we were texting and immediately he was like, okay, so what's your availability? The best days for me are Saturdays because I work and, you know, I, I need time to decompress, da, 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 
So I was like, yes, you know, Saturdays work for me as well. And he was like, cool. Are you available on whatever date that this date, which was August 1st? And I was like, yeah, I'm available on that date. And he was like, cool. This is where we're going. This is what we're doing. This is the time. Like he was set in like wanting to take me out. He wanted like he was not wasting any time. That was a green flag because I was like, okay, usually guys are like the what you doing you to death or expecting you to do, you know, or they're like, well, what do you want to do? Like he was a man with a plan. And that mm-hmm. showed mm-hmm. that showed his integrity, that showed the type of person that he was. And I was like immediately attracted to that. And actions and words, just like you yes. said before, they aligned. Yes, they aligned. And so then we went on our first date and it was, uh, it was the best. Like that's, we consider that our anniversary because we literally like, we just hit it off and we'd seen each other a few more times that same week. And then, you know, things just flowed so well between him and I, mm-hmm. but where intentional dating comes into is because if you know exactly what it is that you want, what you're looking for you know, what the red flags are that you set for yourself that you think are red flags, but also actual red flags as well, what your deal breakers are in relationships. And if you are certain in what it is that you want in a relationship, there will never be a chance for anybody to tell you anything otherwise. Yeah. They will never be able to have somebody persuade you otherwise. And you will feel like I would much rather be alone than be with somebody that I have to settle for because that's not exactly what it is that I'm looking for. And that's what I coach my clients on. That's what I tell my clients. That's what I talk about in my intentional dating workbook. With my intentional dating workbook and intentional dating in general, it's more, it's, you got to focus on what it is that you want. What do you need? What are you looking for? What are your deal breakers? And in doing that, you really have to get to know yourself, fall in love with yourself, forgive yourself for the things that you had to do in order to survive any of your previous relationships, any of your abusive situations. And that is what will help you with dating. And Mm -hmm. so with my husband, I was like, listen, I, first of all, I want to let you know, like I am at the time I identified as bisexual, but I, I'm, I identify as pansexual now, but Mm -hmm. at the time I was like, listen, I'm bisexual. My, my husband's a white man. I was like, I'm, I'm a black woman. I'm an authentic black woman. Like you need to understand what you're getting into with me. And I kind of put that out there. Excited experiences before where you know, I was gone on a couple of dates with the guy and he just didn't respect the fact that I was bisexual and felt like I was going to cheat on him with everybody in the world and da, 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 da. So I felt mm-hmm. like it was important to, you know, put that out there. And then, you know, within a couple of weeks of him and I dating and getting to know each other, I told him, you know, I set my boundaries. That's the big part of intentional dating is setting your boundaries early in a relationship. So you don't waste your time. You don't waste their time. If you guys aren't looking for the same thing. All right, cool. On to the next. And I took my, my biggest boundary that I set was I was like, I don't do screaming and yelling. I don't do insults. I don't do low blows. Like if we're if we can't have nonviolent communication with each other, if we can't communicate with each other without screaming and yelling, if we have a disagreement, then that's just not the relationship for me. And I'll let you know right now, if yeah. that's if that's what you want in a relationship more power to you. And he was like, no, that sounds amazing. Like, how do we, what, what do you, like, tell me more? Like he was very intrigued by that because he had never heard anybody say that to him. Yeah. And yeah. that's what, what I mean. Like, I mean, like three weeks into our relationship, like we are setting boundaries. We're starting to have those conversations. We're starting to have, you know, we're really just like laying the foundation and by month like five, him and I were in therapy together. We were doing couples counseling together because we wanted to make sure that we were maintaining our healthy coping mechanisms and making sure that we were being healthy in our relationship and being able to discuss and talk about some of the harder things. And that's why I'm so passionate about intentional dating because it works. Yeah. I know this happens in my client base, but clients will say like, I'm not good at sticking to my red flags or I mean, my deal breakers or like I like I'm just afraid that I'm going to fall through the pattern again. And I have always felt that like, yes, I hear that, but we have to gain that self-worth and have that self-control to not if we really want love and if we really want love like what you and your husband have, we need to hold ourselves accountable. I'm sure that comes back to a basis of self love and gaining that self-love how do you help your clients regain that sense of self or what are some things that 
or common themes that come up when that topic comes up? Well, I think the biggest part is, is setting boundaries and standing firm in our, in the boundaries that we set. And the reason why we tend to have a hard time with that is because we're afraid of the repercussions that come with staying firm in our boundaries. And one of the biggest repercussions of staying firm in our boundaries is realizing that that's not the person for us. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to accept and acknowledge when you want something to work out so bad that you're like, okay, well, maybe it's worth sacrificing sacrificing this for. And if it's sacrificing your peace, it costs too much. If you are losing pieces of yourself to be in a relationship with somebody else, it's not worth it. If they don't respect your boundaries, they don't respect you. And I tell that to my clients all of the time. Mm -hmm. If they do not respect the boundaries that you set, they don't respect you. If they're having an issue respecting a boundary that you set, imagine what they're going to do when they disagree with you on quite literally anything else that could mm -hmm. turn into an argument. And yeah. so I remind them, like, when you set boundaries and you have a hard time setting your boundaries, if you have a hard time staying in your boundaries, you're teaching them how to treat you. Mm -hmm. And I have a hard time agreeing that it comes down to, like, self-worth and self-love. Mm -hmm. It does to a certain extent, but at the same time, like we said earlier in this conversation, if you don't have the tools, how are you supposed to know what that looks yeah. like? And that's why I think it's very important that during the intentional dating process, which like I said, like I keep referencing my workbook because my workbook has over 16 writing prompts Yeah, that give you an opportunity to really dive deep into yourself, take a deeper look into yourself and what it is that you need. And once you're comfortable in that and you know, but it, it comes with insecurity, deal breakers come with insecurity. Boundaries comes with insecurities because it's like, well, sometimes we feel like, or as survivors, we feel like we're never going to find anything better. Or we're never going to find anything else. We're just, we feel like we're going to be alone forever. And that's not the truth. Mm -hmm. It will be if we keep delaying this, you know, if we keep delaying the inevitable of standing firm in what it is that we want. You're going to meet someone that is going to respect you. You're going to meet someone that's going to care about your needs, about your wants, about what it is that, how you are in a relationship. And, and you know what I'm saying? And so mm -hmm. I just remind my clients, like, listen, like if you set a boundary with someone that genuinely cares about you and wants to care about you, especially if it's early in a relationship, if you set a boundary by saying, hey, I don't want to do screaming and yelling mm -hmm. I like it. I'm not here for it. And the moment they get mad, they start screaming and yelling at you. That's not the relationship for you because mm -hmm. they took your boundary. They internalized it and they just simply said, I don't care. Mm -hmm. They have a hard time respecting that line that you have drawn in the sand. Imagine what other things they are going to do in that relationship with you. And yeah. I mean, feeling disappointment is normal. Feeling sad that something didn't work out that you wanted to work out, that's normal. But don't normalize it to the point where you ignore those things and continue because it's only going to cause you further harm. Yeah. And I think that's such a good point that if they cross the first boundary that you set, just imagine what other boundaries they're going to cross. It's not going to get better. They're already crossing them at the beginning. I'm learning how to be in a healthy relationship now. I just had one end last year and now I'm in a new one and it kind of came on soon. And I was just like, not, I don't know how ready I feel, but I was very open about that. I actually walked away from him. I was having like a, just a mental, a tough mental health day the other day. And I walked away from him and I just was like, look, I don't think I'm just going to get, I'm getting emotional and he hasn't seen me cry. And I was like, I'm just, I need a second. I walked away and he came over, like turned in and was just like, I'm really activated when you walk away. And I would like to find a way that we can not do this, you know, in the future for an argument. And at that moment, I was like, I just need a second. But I was also like, he is telling me his boundary. It's not my job to tell him I can't do it. I can find a middle place. But it was just like that reminder of how many times people have like walked away from me and what that felt like. And like, there was no remorse, there was no conversation. And so I think that 
it's like so important in the beginning to even know what your boundaries are, but also just to really express them and to be open to like a healthy person will also say what theirs are and you'll have yeah. this dialogue and it'll be a beautiful dialogue. Yeah. I think it's great when you realize that the other person is trying to set a boundary as well. Mm -hmm. And you guys are able to work through those boundaries together. You guys are able to work through how to respond to things together. Because oftentimes us survivors, I mean, if I'm being quite honest, sometimes we forget that other people are in, or we're in a relationship with the other person too. And they have boundaries that they want to set and they have to yeah. Oftentimes it's like, well, I've been hurt so bad and it's me, 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 but it's also them, 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 them as well. And I think it's beautiful when you guys are both fine, have the safe space to work through that together and be able to address those things with each other, because that really shows you where the other person is that goes into, you know, the actions are louder than their words as well. It's like, if they're willing to drop down there you know, their barriers that they have up, let their walls down, let you in to say, hey, I've gone through this too. And I, I, I want us to be able to work through this together. I think that's beautiful as well. Yeah. I love that point that you made that as survivors, sometimes we forget we're in relationship with someone else. I have absolutely felt that. And I have worked with clients through that too. And I think it's so important to name that Yes, we've gone through a lot and we've survived a lot and we're probably going to be healing for a long time from it. And we are still in a relationship with another human. And if we want a successful and supportive relationship, we need to be conscious of what their triggers are as well. Yeah, for sure. I said that out loud though. And I think as coaches and influencers and on social media, I think it's important that we talk about the real stuff as well because mm -hmm. There's so much truth to that. Like we often sometimes forget that the other person is here and they have their own things too, because we've just endured so much pain and we have to be able to find the right balance. We have to be healed a certain to a certain level. We have to be willing to reciprocate what we're expecting them to do for us as well. Yeah. Yeah. And if I we're not at that point, that's fine you know, but don't bring anybody else into it until you, you're able to get to that place. What are some things that somebody can look for to ask themselves, am I at that place or not? What do you mean? Like, am I ready to date? I think that's a common question that comes up. Am I ready to date? How do I know I'm ready? How do I know that I'm ready to try? Well, that's a hard question to answer. I, I felt like I was ready to start dating and then when I did and I got ghosted, I had a panic attack for yeah. two days. Yeah. And then you it's know? like, okay, not ready yet. <laughs> yeah. And then I yeah. was like, okay, I need to go back to the NDR. I need to keep working this process. I need to figure out why this is triggering me so much. Like, why does this hurt me so bad? I literally only went on two dates with this person. And it was also because, you know, he had painted that picture again of like, mm -hmm. oh, everything's going to go great. I want to do this and we're going to do that. And da, da 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 And then just straight up ghosted me. And so I feel like if you get to a place where you feel like you're ready to date, keep your expectations kind of low because you're going to have responses. You're going to have trauma responses. And hindsight's twenty twenty, right? Looking back on that situation, I knew that something was off with that situation. I knew something fell off with that situation. And so I say you're ready when you listen to your body and you believe what your body is telling mm -hmm. you gaslighting yourself out of a situation saying that oh you're just making it up when you're listening and truly believing your body what your body is telling you what your gut is telling you in those situations you're ready but the only way you're going to really know is when you do it I for me and I took this if one lesson I took from one of my abusers was which is my stepmother she mm -hmm. told me when you get out of a relationship do not date for six months for six months, no dating, no sex, mm -hmm. nothing. Just really focus on yourself. And that was one of the takeaways I had from that that actually really worked for me. After I broke up, I think it was even after the six month mark, I tried dating for a little bit again and it just wasn't working. And I was like, okay, well, I still want a situation ship because, you know, girls got needs, whatever. And then it got to a place where I was like, well, I'm tired of feeling like, I'm always the girl that the guy wants to sleep with, but the guy doesn't want to marry. And so when that happened, I went on a six months like sex cleanse. Mm -hmm. I was heavy back into my therapy and I was really feeding and pouring into myself the way that I needed to do 
And I think that's one big thing that I feel like I tell some of my clients is like, give yourself time. Because I know as it's human nature for us to want comfort in somebody else and want that with somebody else and want a relationship and want love. And we want that. But there's a journey that happens in between that as well that needs to be taken where we really pour back into ourselves and give ourselves the things that we need because we set the standard. We set the standard for ourselves, right? If someone doesn't treat me better than I treat myself, I don't want it. Yeah. My best friend taught me that. And I used to base it off of how my best friend treated me. And she's like, I gave you the bare minimum. And I'm like, okay, but I've never had the bare minimum. And so the, we set the standards for ourselves. Like if I wouldn't treat me this way, I'm not going to let somebody else treat me this way. But that goes into us being gentle with ourselves, our, the negative self-talk that we have. We have to you know, turn it into positive self-talk. I take myself on dates. I give myself what I wish other people would give me. I say beautiful things about myself. I give myself words of affirmation or whatever my love language is. And I think that's important as well because we set the standard for ourselves. And if somebody's not treating me the way that I wouldn't treat me, then he's got to go or she's got to go yeah. or they got to go. Next. Yeah, I love that. There's a content creator, I guess her name is Nat. She talks a lot about sexual coercion on Instagram mm-hmm. and TikTok. And she was on this pot on my podcast too. I loved our conversation, but that's a big thing that she talks about a lot. And I love it. Of like, I took myself out on dates before I'm taking myself out now, you know, and I will be taking myself out on dates after there's a relationship that I'm forming within myself. No one can treat me better than I treat me, which I think is so different than what we're used to, especially coming from abuse. And I grew up in an abusive home too. And I I had to learn how to treat myself with respect, which was so hard and took so long, but so worth it to learn. I kind of like where my own personal and boundaries within myself lie. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we have to be able to pour into ourselves and it's hard if you don't know how, especially like if you grew up in, in a household where you were just not taught that in general. It's like, how do we do this? Like, how do I do this? How am I supposed to love myself if I don't know what love looks like? Yeah. I thank you so much for coming on here. I really appreciated our conversation. I think a lot of people are really going to appreciate hearing your story and feeling that sense of hope that if they continue to do the work, that they can also have a beautiful relationship and they don't have to keep recreating the same over and over again. Can you share with us your offerings, your coaching, and just tell us about your book one last time and how do people find it? Um, I will make sure all your links are in the show notes, but I really have a feeling people are going to want to connect with you after listening to this. Oh, but thank you. Well, first of all, I apologize if this podcast seems a bit all over the place. I am currently dealing with some health stuff and, you know, I was in remission. I'm no longer in remission when it comes to one of my brain conditions. So Mm -hmm. I apologize if, you know, I. Oh, no. I think I I completely love this conversation and I think it's totally <laughs> fine. And I really appreciate you giving me the time, even though if you're not, even especially if you're not feeling your best. Girl, the show must go on. You know what I'm saying? Work it must is, go on. Yeah. Work does not stop. But yeah, so like I said, you guys can find at least what I offer for coaching and stuff like that at my website at howtolivebatteredwoman.com. But like I said, I'm a certified relationship coach. I do offer an intentional dating boot camp where you get 10 sessions with me and I send you a free copy of my intentional dating workbook and we can work side by side in the workbook together and go over, you know, everything. We set 10 goals with each other, like what we want to, what, what achievable goals we can achieve by the end of the all 10 sessions. So that's one of the biggest things that I'm pushing right now is that it is a commitment, you know, it is something that you have to want to invest in yourself. And if you don't have the ability to do so, that's totally fine. But the Intentional Dating Workbook is out there. My book is Letters to You. It is the most vulnerable version of myself to date that you guys will see because you get to see personal journal entries and creative writing entries and letters to people that I've written that have really hurt me. And it just kind of shows you a lot of the things that I've endured throughout the last couple of years or throughout almost 30 years of existence. And 
you guys find me on Instagram, how to love a battered woman. TikTok is how to love a battered woman. Facebook is how pretty much I'm mm-hmm. how to love a battered woman on everything. Yeah. So, and all your links will be in the show notes so people can easily find you and your yes. website. Yes. And so, yeah, I mean, I offer intentional day. Oh, I also offer, I actually just started offering coaching. It's called power and purpose coaching mm. where I am helping others if they want to find their voice and if they want to get to a place where I've been able to get to as far as coaching and talking about my story and things that I've survived. I also offer coaching in that as well. So if you're looking to step into your power and define your purpose, I offer coaching in that as well. Awesome. Thank you so much. Again, I really appreciate your time and I'm excited to continue learning about your story. Yeah. Thank you for having me and I really appreciate it. Don't forget to grab your copy of the book too. I'd love to know what your thoughts are. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I've been journaling my whole life actually. So, and like yeah. definitely during these times. So I feel like that's right on par. I just saw the book. I mean, I just, I did like a Instagram refresh of you today and I was like, oh, I <laughs> didn't know you had the book, but I'm, I definitely will. Yeah, I haven't been promoting it as much because I dropped it right around my 30th birthday. And then I had all of my friends and stuff come in town. Uh So I haven't got a chance to do more promo on it and talk about it more. But I'm actually really excited to keep pushing it and excited to see what people say. Awesome. Awesome. I really, really appreciate your time. I really enjoyed our conversation. And I hope we can do this again in the future. Yeah, thanks for rescheduling. I know things have been crazy. It's okay. I think it's crazy at both ends. I'm a single parent. I know you work multiple jobs, so I totally get it. Yeah. (laughs) Sure. (laughs) All right. Well, thank you. And I hope that you have a good rest of your day. You too. Okay. Bye. Bye.